Good morning, everyone. Sunday, December 28th, 2014. The subject is Christian science. We're going to talk about Mrs. Eddy's article, Obedience, today. Uh, starts on page 116, the miscellaneous writings. So if you could all get your books or whatever, however you read it. Also, we will, for the most part, keep you off mute. Maybe not all of you, but most of you will be off mute. Um, and please mute yourself with your own phone if possible, especially if there's any sound, extraneous sound in your house. Okay, page 116, miscellaneous writings. Anyone want to volunteer to read who has their book ready? I do. Yeah. Jane, okay, go ahead, Jane, you start. My beloved students, this question ever near to my heart is today uppermost. Are we filling the measures of life's music aright, emphasizing its grand strains, swelling the harmony of being, the tones when came glad echoes, as a crescendo and diminuendo, diminuendo, excuse me accent music, so the varied strains of human chords express life's loss or gain, loss of the pleasures and pains and pride of life, gain of its sweet concord, the courage of honest conviction, and final obedience to spiritual law. The ultimate of scientific research and attainment in divine science is not an argument. It is not merely saying divine science. It is, it is not merely saying, but doing the word, demonstrating truth, even as the fruits of watch, watchfulness, prayer, struggle, tears, and triumph. Thank you, Jean. So, who would like to speak? What does that mean to any of you listening? Well, I, I like the part that talked about it's doing, not just merely saying, which uh, really reflected in the lesson this week with Mary um, do, showing her gratitude versus the Pharisee not doing anything but just merely saying. Yes, thank you. Anyone else on that paragraph? Well, it's, it, to me, um, I had an experience this week of using the Unity Watch on Thursday night. Just knowing that this truth could be felt by all, I was able to pray for a, a little dog in our midst and just had a wonderful a wonderful experience of this dog by the next morning being completely free of the problem and it was it was just a quiet knowing knowing that this truth is for all and it was a wonderful experience we each every day every moment we get opportunities to be using this Christ not just Christ truth not just saying the words but using it knowing it living it and it should make a difference with everything about our, our lives, our homes, our families, and reaching out, our neighbors, our church, everyone everywhere should feel this power radiating out as we are expressing it, not just speaking it. I know in my experience, I felt that those that have had the greatest influence on me are those that simply did, because you get a sense of who and what they are and the substance of their being. Whereas someone who goes around doing a lot of talking, uh, it's, it can be pretty much a turn off. Actually, it can be a detrimental thing to, to the unity of the good that's going on. Thank you. Yeah, in a way, this is what I felt from this article in, in, many, in many ways, this idea of being the example, your obedience to God will be this example, uh, and it will permeate everything. 
Um, I think, um, sorry. no, go ahead, Florence. Yeah, I like the, uh, what the word she uses here, uh, but doing the word, I hear an echo. Yeah, we're going to have to mute. Okay, who was it? Um, okay, Tom, we had to mute you. There was an echo. Go ahead. Okay, Aren't it is the um, demonstrating truth, even as the fruit of watchfulness, prayers, struggles, tears, and trials. Certainly, you know, the doing involves all those. And I, I remember my own experience, how many tears, how many times it's, you know, like a mental struggle. But then the, the, the what, what she says, when the battle clears, there is a certain piece that makes you, yes, I want to stay obedient because the triumph is much more. I mean, the peace that comes after all this is much more than whatever the so-called suffering or tears had been. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important point. You're not going to get to demonstrate the truth unless you've had the, the fruits of the watchfulness, prayer, struggles, tears, and triumph. Another thing that I thought was important is about obedience here is it says that there are losses and there are gains. And it's just a natural thing that happens. But the losses are the things that need to be lost, like the pride of life, dependence on pleasures or pains of the sense or whatever. But what's gained from losing those is priceless. Yeah, and the hymn, Mrs. Eddy, says lost is gain. And uh, we, we have to have infinite patience. You know, sometimes things do not always work out the way we would like, the way that we would pray. And we have to we have to have a tremendous amount of of humility and, and a willingness to keep going, whether things turn out the way we would particularly want them to or not, but trust it to God. And sometimes that's very difficult, and sometimes that's where the tears come. Uh, we might not win everything or, or gain everything that we thought we should, but that doesn't mean that we give up or, the quote that Florence referred to, become a sluggard in the race. You think of what Mrs. Eddy went through, and she kept going, and not just kept going, but with great joy and power and perseverance and strength and can we do less is the question okay the next uh, two paragraphs uh, go ahead Florence I'll read mm -hmm. thank you obeying the divine principle which you profess to understand and love demonstrates truth never absent from your post, never off guard, never ill-humored, never unready to work for God is obedience, being faithful over a few things. If in one instance obedience be lacking, you lose a scientific rule and its reward, namely to be made ruler over many things. A progressive life is the reality of life that unfolds its immortal principle. The student of Christian science must first separate tears from the weak, discern between the thought, motive, and act superinduced by the wrong motive or the true, the God-given intent volition, arrest the former and obey the latter. This will place him on the safe side of practice. We always know where to look for the real scientist and always find him there. I agree with Reverend Dr. Talmage that there are wit, humor, and enduring vivacity among God's people. Thank you. Okay, the first, the first paragraph she read. Obeying the divine principle, which you profess to understand and love, demonstrates truth. The absolute obedience. We do profess to, to love it. 
but to obey it is, is something else. Okay, and then the next that I, I love so much, and if you don't know these, you, sh you should. They should be part of like what I call your arsenal. The first, never absent from your post. What does that mean to you? To be a spiritual minute person. To always be alert without fail. To be ready to do what God wants us to do without question. Thank you. You know, I have to say about Zari and Uta, we've had, I've had others call from Europe and, uh, you know, come maybe for a while, but not the way Zari and Uta have, where they have been so faithful over a long period of time now and always joining us at, at our round table and our Bible studies. Now they've been recording things and Uta had done some wonderful translations in German. So to me, that speaks volume, speaks a lot to me, more than just the words, because others have promised and said they would do things, and then, then they haven't. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful for faithfulness. Never absent from your post, yes. Are you always reachable? You know, it's important in doing this work. Um, I know at the story in Mrs. Eddy's home, where someone wanted to, or, or I guess she couldn't, she needed one of her students, and, and they were gone or for some reason. And uh, they, they took a one-day vacation, <laughs> and it was the wrong day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was the wrong day. It was the wrong thing. She needed them at that time. So they had not demonstrated. They had not heard God's voice, and and they were gone. And she rebuked that, even though it was just a one day, and they're there all the other days. And that doesn't mean for any of you that you don't do things or take some vacations. But if, if you were gone or if you were needed or if you were obviously not at your post, then uh, think about that. Most of you have learned now, though, when you have proofing and other things, you make sure you, you get it done and you don't just leave. I mean, how could we operate if we had people just doing this, that, and the next thing with no accountability? Anyone else never absent from your post? It reminded, <clears throat> excuse me, it reminded me of a soldier standing watching, always prepared to um, do what God tells them. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it relates to the question, you know, do you feel like you have a post? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true, too. Do you feel like you have a post? You all should feel like you have a post. You all do. If you're a part of this, you do have a post. I mean, we each have a divine mission, but do we feel it? Do we, do we strive to live up to it? And we also mentioned never ill humored. Well, well, we're not there yet, fairly. We're taking one at a time. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Suzanne. I, I, whenever um, I might be tempted to think that, wow, that's a lot of service. I always think of God. He is <laughs> never absent from His post. I mean, He's He's there for us 24/7 for all of His children, and. It just puts it into perspective for me as a, as a reflection of God. I am to be ever active, and what I'm doing certainly can't even begin to be the 24/7. God is always there for us. Yes. And uh, Mrs. Eddie was always there 24/7. She never. Well, and that's it. You think of the, the sacrifices that have preceded us. Well, we, what we're asked to do is really nothing. You're not asked to, you know, uh, well, what Mrs. Eddy was, was asked, what Christ Jesus was asked to do, at least not at this point, not yet, not so far. <laughs> when you think of all those sacrifices of people who gave their lives or members of their family for, for fighting for freedom, there have been a huge amount of sacrifices. 
And, it, and if we can't do at least our part, and you must understand that this is what happens, that all these people who have given their lives to this, to freedom, to, to have Christian science, all of these things, and then we he are here get content and complacent and would rather go, I don't know, out on our, I use a golf course, but whatever you want to, whatever, and, and it's not actually playing golf that's so bad unless you make a god of it and, and let it take you over so that you are absent from your post when you are needed. You must all remember we've actually been asked to do very little. Don't ever think it's some great big thing. Be grateful that it's what it is and make sure you're not absent from your post because if we are and if we fail to do this work, there will be. We, we read about it. That's why we have our Bible studies. What happens? What happens when everyone gets complacent and goes to the other gods? Entire nations get destroyed. Yes. And there's suffering and slavery and other things. And Mrs. Eddy herself predicted that that would happen again unless we did what we should be doing and do it with great joy. It shouldn't be drudgery. Okay, um, the next is never off guard, which is similar but different in a way. When I think of this, it makes me think about this um, in Science and Health where it talks about Stan Porter at the door of thought, admitting only such conclusions as you wish realized in bodily results. Yes, that's good. Mm. Well, but it's very common uh, when you are off guard or when you are not on your post. Um, it's very easy to fall into temptation. Um, because you're not watching, I think. Uh, so that goes to what are we watching? Which I think the most important place to start is to watch our own thoughts. And, uh, and if you don't do those things, if you don't engage yourself or your life with doing the things that God wants you to do, watching and praying, you can easily fall into temptation because the temptation are there. And you don't really have anything to you know, to protect yourself from. Yes. You know, there are many temptations out in this world. A lot of it comes through people that ex want you to fulfill their expectations, do what they want, and uh, their way of getting around it is to get you off guard. If you lose your guard and you don't see what's going on, or you fail to uh, do what it says in the next paragraph about judging rightly the motive behind things, either the right or the wrong motive, you lose your guard. Uh, Open the door. Know, uh, I think that what happens in the arts, for example, is many times if someone recognizes you, you would see this with politicians maybe, or people in the media, if we don't stay awake, if we don't watch our own thoughts and be one with God, it's so easy to be lured and lulled into a sleeplessness, and then it's pretty sad. Yes, thank you. Does anyone... You have to stand quarter at the door of thought. Yes. Thank you. Has anyone given an example of being off guard? Being distracted and doing your own thing. Okay. Well, you know, about if, go ahead, Florence. No, if you forget and just go about doing things your own way and, you know, going about your daily life without God in it, without the thought of God in it, you, you are of God and things happen. happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, forgetting, that's a good sign of being off guard. Um, well, there are other ways, and e even when you, you know, if you have a, some little accident or bumping into something or you lose something, those are all ways you've gotten off guard. You're not listening. You, you somehow drifted off. So take those as, as warnings, first warnings, if you will, that you're, you're getting off guard. Sometimes you can be off guard. Someone will say something that maybe, where did that come from? <laughs> You'll be, you know, a little surprised by what is said. That's being off guard. 
Jesus was uh, never I, off guard. Go ahead. No, I, well, I was going to give another example of um, when you're used to doing something and you do it all, all the time, you can get very off guard thinking, oh, yes, I do this all the time. I know it. And you do it and here it goes, with, you know, without praying about it. And suddenly I've done it. That's what I'm saying, you know. I, there's something that you do all the time, so you're doing it this time and you're not praying about it. Suddenly there, there was a mistake. So um, yeah. you can be off that, that way. Let me give two examples if, I'm, uh, if you guys can give me a few seconds for it. Um, I remember when I started driving, that was like, um, I can't remember, but that was like many years ago. Um, I remember that morning I was going to school, but because I think I was off guard, I got myself caught into what I was going to do at school that day. So, But I remember very clearly that I received a very good warning that morning, but since I got caught up into something that I'm not really, I should get caught up into. I didn't pay attention to the message that I got that morning. But I got involved in an accident that time that I eventually lost the car that I was driving that time as a result of this accident. But after that time, I remember that I got a very vivid warning about the accident that morning, but I didn't pay attention to it. So that's an example of been off guard and I paid a very huge price for it. Yeah. And another incident was also another when I, I got similar uh, warning related to driving too. And that means it was very clear to me to pray. Not just for myself, for every other driver. And I pray very calmly, even though I was driving but I pray in my heart, whatever it was going to be that God would protect me and protect everyone else. Guess what? It wasn't even up to a minute when I got on the highway. There was a drunk driver on the highway right in front of me. And the car was swinging back. A uncontrolled um, driving. Right in front of me, I was actually looking at the driver. And I knew this is what it was. And uh, thank God the driver, maybe he woke up from sleep or whatever he was doing. I started driving like a normal driver. And I was so grateful to God that he sent the message to me and I pray about it and everyone was saved. And um, it's just a very good example of, about being on God and being off God. Thank you. That's excellent. I hope you all got that. Yes. Good. Yeah. And th this is why this, this science shouldn't be, oh, some big horrible thing, drudgery that we have to do. This is the most exciting thing in the world. You're getting these messages from God constantly. Um, he's telling you always what to do, where to be. Uh, whether you listen to or not, that's something else. But this is exciting, this, this science. So, and it's never too much work. And, and you all know, I know you know, when you've been off guard, and as Benjamin said, you have a high price to pay because you were off guard. How much better to be on guard and to hear the warning and to spare yourself and then to be grateful, as Benjamin was. Don't just take it as a coincidence or say it would have happened anyway or so what or that's my just do. No, he knew it was God working in his life and he's very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you all. Anybody else for <coughs> never off guard? I think uh, Jesus once said... Uh, know when to say yay yay and nay nay if you think about that you will live a perfect life what is your yay yay be attitudes what's your nay nay ten commandments if you live by those you live a perfect life okay <laughs> <laughs> who was out who else was about to speak oh i was just going to say that one of the things that catches me off guard is when i start absorbing the um things around me if I uh, maybe see someone ill or get caught up in maybe some behavior I'm seeing around and not correcting it in my thought and allowing it to build. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say something as well. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, about uh, oh, back in 1980, in November, 
I was uh, living in an art studio building, and a thought, like a big voice came to me when I drove back from Mexico, do not go into that building. And I ignored it, and then I had to deal with a very difficult fire in the studio, uh, somebody setting something up. And you know, I really know when God tells you to do something, I have to listen. Because every time I don't listen, I get in trouble. Thank you. Using this wonderful, still voice that is persistent, if you don't do that, please try this way. Thank you. This is the way, walkie in it. Thank you. I know for me, sometimes I get distracted and then I don't even hear God speaking and forget to do something and that's really important. So I have to learn not to let things take me off, off guard. Yes? Or if you've been doing a lot of work for church and then you take it personally, you think, oh, I've done so much, I think I just relaxed for a few minutes. And that's just when it comes right in on you. Yeah. Yeah, and the work, all, all the work, all the work we should do should be for God, and it should be joyous and restful. Um, not that we have a time we work for God and a time we don't. We should always be with God, working for Him. Yeah, another example was in the Bible when Jesus, I mean, it was a very intense period of His missionary work. Um, a lot of temptation was going to happen. And he saw this temptation. Some of them he has already told them, the people that Peter he has told him already what his temptation was going to be. And he told him to work on it. And some of even Judas also has his own temptation coming. And they refused to work on it. Remember, the few times he came to them, they were sleeping. He woke them up and told them to walk and pray. So they don't fall into this temptation that is crowded everywhere. And he came back again. They were sleeping again. He woke them up again the second time, the Bible says, and told them to watch and pray. But you know what? Some did watch and some did not watch. People like Peter did not watch. And he fell into this temptation of denial of Christ. And the Judas too did not watch and he fell into this temptation of betrayal of, of Christ and that's another example of that and the price was really really not good for them okay thank you um, never ill humored was that you fairly that wanted to answer that one well Sam, go ahead well, it just jumped out at me because it can trap you. Um, but it has to be a way that uh, one has given up when one works in Christian science. What, what are you saying? What can trap you? Well, maybe waking up and feeling ill-humored. Oh, well, I mean, you know, I don't know. How do you get ill humored? <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not something I. Well, I think yeah, sometimes you feel ill. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think sometimes you feel ill humored when you feel like you're giving up something that you don't want to. You know, there's self in that. And that's sometimes that's when I get ill humored. It's just when I'm like, ah, geez, I have to go do this. Or if there's something I, if I'm working on something and there's some dear, cherished human belief I don't want to give up, you know, it can, that can make me ill humored. <laughs> so, and what what is this cherished thing you don't want to give up, or do, do you not want to share that? Or <laughs> oh no, well, you know, there was times like when I had to kind of give up such a personal sense of family. I mean, that was a very hard thing to give up. I got real cranky about it, you know. It's just like, well, I don't understand this, and I, you know, I get all wrapped around the axle. And um, okay, well, that's it good. very ill. Okay, thank you. Good. I think also getting ill humor can be when you want a, a healing. For, 
you know, how long is this going to take, you know? I mean, and then you get all, you know, angry or whatever at God, but you dare to get angry at God. You know, you're human. Thank you. And, and yet, joy and gratitude are two essential ingredients to any healing. Remember that. So if you are ill-humored, that's not helping you to get better. And as we've talked about, you don't wait till after you're feeling better to be joyful and grateful. You've got to start even if you're not feeling good. The whole point of it, get out of that mesmeric state. Rise up out of your bed. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Start praising God. That's what moves the mountains. That's the prayer and fasting we've talked about. Remember when Mrs. Evans taught us some years ago, she said you should wake up and you should be thanking God. And if you can't think of something to thank God for, well, then keep working at it until you find something <laughs> to thank Him for it. Thank you, yep. Yeah. And you know, Mrs. Eddie has said to bleed sweetly, and that kind of goes along maybe with what Fairly or also Lenny, all, what all of you have said to bleed sweetly. If you're going through a difficult time and, and things seem really awful and you are inclined to get grumpy or whatever, you bleed sweetly. You don't don't let it get to you this way. This is very important that you stay um, in this proper frame of of uh, good humor, not ill humor, but good humor. Don't become an old grouchy old crank. You know, you can see it on people's faces sometimes when they're in repose. They just look so cranky. Don't don't do that. You're you're damning yourself. You truly are. There's a new article on the carousel now. It's called Age, but it, it talks about that, and, and age can happen at any time. I mean, the idea of getting old and cranky. You don't have to be so-called old in years. So, something to think about. Make sure you keep your humor. And, and so often, I think, especially when I hear so much about what could be wrong, is, is a good laugh better to laugh than cry if, if possible. The one thing Eric can't stand is to be laughed yeah. at. Yes, it doesn't like <laughs> yeah, it. Yes, it breaks the mesmerism, but you can laugh yes. at it. Thank you. I was just going to say yeah. that. Laugh or cry, do something. Thank you very much. It breaks the mesmerism. If you can laugh, if you can see how silly it is, how stupid mortal mind is, how dumb it is. That's why, that's why a good funny movie is always... <laughs> sometimes a good thing to, to partake in, just to lift your spirit, keep yourself joyful. You know, that's a misunderstanding some people have about being a Christian, I mean, not just being a Christian when you are getting asked about it, but being a very active Christian, some people don't want to get into that, and that's what, especially younger people, that's why many of them withdraw from the things that they should be doing as Christians. Because they think becoming a Christian takes away those privileges of like humor, like doing good things that will bring joy to your life. Um, because you should mean, believe, I, I believe, when you're a Christian, you don't have fun, you don't laugh, you don't do all that stuff. Because some churches don't do that, they become too serious about things, and they lost their gratitude and uh, their joy eventually. Thank you. But it's not true. Yeah. Christianity has to be about you know, somebody said to me that here, yeah, I don't know if it's written somewhere. If you're not having good time serving God, you're not serving God. Yeah, that was it was Big Dal Young, <laughs> something or you're not practicing Christian yeah, science. You're not practicing. If you're not having a good time, you're not practicing Christian science. It should be. It should be. Um, and, and not always, of course. And it's not a Pollyanna, oh, you're so happy and ignoring every terrible thing that's going on under your nose. No, it's the real peace, the real joy that God gives. And it's a sign, as we read, as we read later, what Dr. Talmadge says, I think, yes. That there's wit, there are wit, humor, and enduring vivacity among God's people. That should be characteristic of you. That should be characteristic of you. Do you claim those qualities? Do you express the joy, the wit, the humor? 
and the vivacity, the sprightliness, the joie de vivre, the not oh my another day, oh my gosh, here we go, here we go, yeah, all this drudgery, all this work I got to do today. <laughs> you ever get that way, then you really shake yourself and read that watching point number one. Carpenter says, don't even try to attempt to do anything unless you do it with, with joy. It, it, it's essential. It, it's a quality of God. So anyone else on that one? I happen to love that one. It's important um, to remind I no. Go ahead. Larry. I wanted to share something, if I could. I um, made me think of the book, The Greatest Thing in the World, and in the section where um, he's breaking down the different um, elements of love, and one of them is about um, having a good temper, not being easily provoked. And then he goes on to say it's not um, so much the temper that's significant, but what it reveals. And uh, I just wanted to read one line. It says. Um, a sample of the most hidden products of the soul dropped involuntarily when one's off guard. And I thought that was interesting. Yes. Yeah. 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 I've, I've, I've uh, what occurred to me was that, you know, when I'm ill-humored, it really is the result of having a personal agenda and being disappointed that my personal agenda didn't work out. And to me, the answer is get rid of the personal agenda if you want to get rid of ill humor. And it, add it, on to, go ahead, sir. No, to add no. on to that, my personal agenda, I think I'm doing so well and I'm being so nice. And then somebody will say something that I think is mean. And then I become, I find myself being coming ill humored. But that's my agenda. And then I'm learning, uh, and then I stop, and it's, I realize. So thank well, you, you're right. Yeah, it's an important discipline not to take anything personally. Yeah. Because you're, you know, when you're, when you're obeying God, you're, <laughs> you know, you will be attacked, you know, verbally. Mm -hmm. And you can't take it personally. Yeah, let it take your joy. Jesus says, um, you know, that with my joy, no man taketh from you. And that's because it's not dependent on outward circumstances. It comes to you from God and from obedience to God. I heard someone once say, and I think this must be so true, that they felt Jesus must have been a very happy, joyous, even a fun-loving person. And they said they know that. Would anyone offer a reason? The little children loved him. Do the little children love old grumpy grouches? <laughs> no, little children love people that are fun-loving and joyful. And I mean, it's a wonderful picture, a way to think of Jesus in that way. And, and he had to have been. He loved, the, he loved the little children, but they loved him too. And it was because of that, I am sure. Certainly his love, his Christliness, but I'm, I'm sure he was joyful and fun to be around. I think other religions lose sight of that, though. They they kind of hang their hats on that man of sorrows phrase and think he was a gloomy Gus, but I agree with you. How could he have been? Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. No, and, and we must, you know, we must not, because I, I, there's sometimes, I, you know, I feel I'm going down that line, too, I, and, and we mustn't think that, that his life was just, you know, all this toil and sorrow and misery. Um, I'm, I'm sure it couldn't have been if he walked with God and if the children, the little children loved him. All the wonderful healing work he did. Yeah, we did. Women know. felt safe to come up to him, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank he, you. Even Lazarus and his two sisters are very good friends of his. Yeah. And they're not part of his disciples. No. I do. That's right. There's a lot of things when you read between the lines in the Bible. Okay, and then lastly, but not least, I'm ready to work for God. Hmm. Well, I'm sure we've all been there. <laughs> Maybe it's what Lenny said too, where she, you know, you're you're kind of asked to do 
maybe something you're not that crazy to do, crazy to, happy to do, and you could be rumbling about it. But we should always be ready to work for God, never grumbling about it. As someone else was saying, he's always there for us, and we are his reflection. And uh, if we're unready to work for him, perhaps it's because we have a false concept of what his work is. My issue is knowing, is this what God wants me to do, or is this what I want to do? So I yes. struggle with that a little bit. Right. Well, and that's the, what the next paragraph is all about, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we covered that very thoroughly, thank you, and, and realizing this is obedience. So if you ever wonder what obedience is, you can go back to those things and think about them. And, and really, you should remember them. Think about them during the day. They can only help and bless you. They're not out to be stern schoolmasters. They're out to bless. Okay, and then, yes, the next paragraph. Um, separating the tares from the wheat discerning between the thought motive and the act superinduced by the wrong motive or the true, the God-given intent and volition. Arrest the former and obey the latter. My goodness, what does that mean? Stop with your wrong motives and get with God. Understand. Okay, thank you. To do. How can you sometimes be deceived by the motive? You know, error can be pretty tricky. Hmm. Well, you know, it, the example has been given about, you know, charity that people can give, but their whole motive is maybe just to look good or to maybe in their mind get God off their back, so to speak. <laughs> I've given, I've given you know, the charity, or I've helped somebody, but it's not really because there's a deep love in your heart or a caring or that you feel that it's something that God has wanted you to do. Those kind of things can be deceiving if you don't question yourself and ask, why are you really, why do you really want to do this? Is it based on God or not? Or is it out of guilt? Yeah. Yeah, guilt is a huge one to get your motives off. And that's the old theology that most of us have been steeped in. So you feel very, very guilty and you do things that out of personal sense and not because God is directing it. Any anyone else I'd like to hear. Does this ever happen in families? <laughs> oh family member will persuade you to do something or and you feel like you just have to because they're family Shahida Shahida's here today do you have anything to say Shahida in regards to a wrong motive yeah how do you separate the tears from the wheat <laughs> usually if it's only going to benefit me it's all about me that's a clue that's the wrong motive <laughs> that's, that's a very good one thank you how about Janet yeah um, sometimes it is hard to, to distinguish is it my thought or is it God and I have to stop and and really think about is this your will or am I doing it because I think it's the right thing to do. It does keep you on your toes, and it's a good thing, really. It's a very good thing, and it's very important. And, it, and she goes on to say that this will place you on the safe side of practice. So it's something required of us all, and, and it needs to be considered. See? So... I, yeah, I would, right motives give opinions to thought. Wrong motives probably just, you know, cut the wings off. Thank you. <laughs> Good way to put it. Absolutely. 
And if you have a personal sense of someone, you, you will impute a right motive to them when you shouldn't. If you've got s someone that you've respected for a long time or has been a friend for a long time, and you don't judge the motive, but rather you, you, you just say, well, if it's from this person, it's got to be okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. That's very dangerous. You always are, are testing, checking, listening. What is spiritual sense telling you? When I was new to the church in Christian science, every Wednesday something would come up with a family member that I would not be able to get to church. And it happened a couple of times. And I mentioned it to a practitioner, and a practitioner told me that was animal magnetism, and it was using me to be nice when I had something to do for God. And after the next time it happened, I said, I can't help you now because I'm going to church. It stopped. It never happened again. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good example and I know many of you are finding that to be true as, as you're progressing in science and have more and more things to do how it would try to stop you I'm going to end now this is volume one of spiritual precepts page 177 and 179 God knows that each of his children has the capacity to hear the messages of wisdom and love that he is sending out but mortal existence provides so many interests so many diversified entertainments that it is rare to find one sitting down with a definite and direct expectancy that God is broadcasting to him and that he must tune in, that in order to do that he must throw aside and eradicate the belief in any power apart from God claiming to introduce that which would deflect the message, reverse it, stand between God and man, and thus prevent the message from being received, or if received, being distorted or reversed. We must realize that there is nothing that can stand between man's desire to hear and the fulfillment of that desire. If you ever expect to hear the voice of God, you must accept the proposition that his voice is now sending out its messages continuously, and doing this because you possess a capacity to hear it. No one can rob you of that. And the reason you do not hear it is because of your lack of focusing your attention on that fact by letting other things occupy your thought. Thus you postpone your effort and fail to receive. So when you seek to hear God's voice and do not seem to do it, don't be disappointed. Every day make the effort to open your thought and let God talk to you. And if you are not conscious of his doing so, if you do not hear it with your material ears or even not conscious of it with your conscious thought, take it on faith. Believe that it is being recorded on the tablet of your mind, that you are laying up treasure in heaven in your spiritual consciousness. And when the right time comes, you will be able to give it out and know what, what God has been saying to you by what you say to another. Okay, very good. And Gilbert Carpenter. Very good. So good. thank you all. And we'll go now and have a, a good healing service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.